Well, it's a little later than nine o'clock in the morning, but hopefully it still applies to you today. Uh, we're here at church, and uh, I'm just uh, excited to share with you God's Word. My name is Calvin. I'm one of the pastors here at Beacon, and um, I I am excited to um, have our second birthday party coming up. We talked about that. We got these invite cards. We yesterday went to Old Home Days, where we got to be in the community. One of the cool things about uh, our church is we, we don't just want to do big events, and we love parties. I like doing big events, but we, we want to go where people are, um, and one of the great things is going to community events to, to show people who we are as Christians, um, that we can be a beacon of truth, hope, and light, sharing the good news in our community. So thank you guys for those of you that stopped by. Uh, it is fun to see all the different organizations, churches, and people that you get to meet, and uh, it's fun for me to see who knows who, and you see the random person walk past that knows someone who comes to Beacon, and, and uh, we get to, to really share the good news with people through how we live. So thank you guys for being a part of that. Uh, we, as Trina mentioned, uh, we're in a series called Sent, and what we're doing is we're looking at the early church, how God formed the church, and how the church itself is, is not just a group of people coming on a Sunday morning, but it's a movement. And what we looked at last week, we said that as a movement, by nature, definition, if you're a part of a movement, you got to move. You uh, ever been through an exercise class where somebody is standing in the back and just not participating? <laughs> when I was in high school, um, we, we had the choice to, to choose whether or not we wanted to do, uh, we, had to, we could choose what activity we did one semester. And uh, being a, a junior boy in high school, um, I didn't want to do the, uh, the soccer, the rugby, the, the tackle sports, because I realized that in the gymnasium was um, aerobics. And I realized that I could, have, I could be one of two guys with 100 girls in high school doing aerobics. But the problem was I didn't really want to do aerobics. I just wanted to go and hang out with the girls in high school. So I would stand at the back of the room and, and uh, kind of stretch a little bit. And, uh, uh, but you got to move when you're a part of something. And I'd always get called out. The teacher caught on while I was there and would bring me to the front and do different things. And not what I wanted, but as a church, we don't want to just be consumers. We don't want to just sit here and be like, okay, yeah, 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 this whole Jesus thing. And I'll do a few good things here and there. We want to be people that are moving with the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to look at Pentecost and then the message that Peter preached out of Pentecost. The, the early disciples, the followers of Jesus, they had this spirit. Spirit come upon them that empowered them to do amazing things. A lot of historians look at the early church and they wonder, how did Christianity go from these 12 followers, these 120 followers, all the way throughout the whole world in such a quick time? 2,000 years seems like a long time ago now, but, but back then they didn't have cars and airplanes. They couldn't go to places like Nicaragua where I just went to share the good news. They, they had to walk places, ride ponies and horses and carts. And, and yet, Jesus had given his followers a God-sized vision for this new church. And I bet you they were petrified. <laughs> They're probably wondering, how on earth are we going to impact the whole world when we're just a group of uneducated guys sitting here from Galilee? But God had something more for them. This supernatural power that we're going to talk about, that the Holy Spirit came upon them, and God provided the means by which they were able to complete the mission he sent them on. And so our memory verse in this series is found in Acts chapter 1. We put this up on the, the screen together, verse 8. So let's read this out loud. If you're watching online, join in us, read it wherever you are. It goes like this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus had told these disciples there was this great mission he had for them, this commission that they were sent to be witnesses everywhere. And then he goes, and by the way, I'm actually leaving. And Jesus went up into heaven. <laughs> and these people had this great mission they were a part of. But then Jesus said, oh, and by the way, I, I need you to wait until the time is right. Now, I don't know about you, but if I get given a mission, I don't want to wait. I, I want to get the ball rolling. You're like a planner. And you're like, okay, so uh, here's what we're going to do first. Then you do this, you do that, let's go. I, I don't like to wait, but, but they said wait. Oftentimes, we, we want to get ahead of what God wants us to do. And oftentimes, we think we, we're like, God, I know you said wait, but I got a great idea. 
my idea is probably better than yours. And uh, here's what I should do. What do you think? Already knowing you've decided you're going to do it. And, and you go to head of what God wants you to do, and then things don't always go the way you want them to, right? Well, Jesus had the disciples wait in Jerusalem, and he told them, wait until the Holy Spirit comes on you. Because he said, I'm not going to be with you physically in the flesh, but my spirit is going to come and reside in you. And they probably were all confused, thinking, what on earth is this about? You ever see the old uh, horror movies where the, the demons come inside and it's like a, 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 like a ghost going inside your mouth and all this weird stuff? I, I don't think that's what it, he was referring to. Oftentimes people think like that. But Jesus said, wait. And we're going to look today at what happened at Pentecost. And then we're going to go and, and study what Peter said in the first official message preached from the church. So in Acts 1, verse 4, it says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. He, he, he wants them to follow his plan. And he, he says, you'll not be able to accomplish anything without this power that I have for you. John Stott, a, a famous preacher, he puts it this way. He says, a body without breath is a corpse. So the church without the spirit is dead. This is the vision we have for our church. We want us to start every day by saying, God, fill me with your spirit because I know that it's only by your power I'm able to do anything. It's only by your power that us as a church can, can have an impact in our world. And, and oftentimes when we get out of line with the spirit is where we do some big damage, right? A lot of people... Uh, especially my age group, millennials, feel like they have a lot of church hurt. Maybe you're sitting here too and you're like, tell me about it. A lot of times that happens when people get out of step with the Spirit and start doing their own way. So as a church today, our vision is we want to be powered by the Spirit. We, we want everything we do to be following after the Holy Spirit. That means that, that we need to know what it means to follow the Holy Spirit. We, we can see that the Holy Spirit has some great impact in our lives that has an impact in our world. And so today we're going to pick up the story in Acts 2, but I can't understate enough the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. What it means to be empowered, being filled. In verse 2 it says, Suddenly a sound like a, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So the disciples, these followers of Jesus, had gone through a pretty traumatic experience with Jesus dying on the cross, coming back from the dead, and, and it had been pretty crazy for them. And then Jesus says, go wait in Jerusalem. So they were pretty much hiding out in a room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come on them. Now, y you probably can imagine, they were probably thinking, how do we know when it's time to go? Like, is Jesus going to, like, speak down from heaven, give us the thumbs up, green light means go, and, and we're going to start going out, and I'm not sure where we're going yet, but we're going to do it, and sitting there waiting. I think God knew that. He's probably chuckling up, up in heaven. And so they, they send this, this dramatic experience where they probably didn't feel the wind, but they heard the wind outside, and then they saw the, these flames come and sit upon each and every one of them, and it was pretty crazy. Now, hear me on this. This is an abnormal experience. Uh, I don't think this would have happened for you. It didn't happen for me. When, when I became a Christian and the Holy Spirit entered me, I was not sitting there and it got really windy and this visible flame came and landed. That, that didn't happen for me. That doesn't happen anymore. It happened when the Spirit came and resided for the first time in the, the disciples, the apostles, who, who received the Holy Spirit and it settled within them. Jesus had gone so that something greater could come to lead and guide them. This was happening at, at a time called Pentecost. And what, what this was about, got, all the Jew, Jewish people would come to Jerusalem and, and the city would swell in numbers. It would be huge. The population, I, I think God had a plan here. You see, wait until I'm ready. And then he tells us to go. The population was huge. And thank you, Trina, for reading all of those different nations and tongues that I didn't have to pronounce. That was great. And, and it was between the, the two harvests, the barley and the wheat harvest. And and in essence, there's a big festival party going on. And we see here that there's people from all different nations. Now think about this. God's mission for his disciples was start here, build out, and go to all of the world. You ever have a 
an issue with God's timing? Like, do you believe that God's timing is perfect? I do, but I don't like it because it doesn't always align with my timing. And so when, when I look at what God wants us to do, I know he's sovereign and I know he's in charge and I know that what he wants is best, but I don't always like it. And so with this, I, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, okay, God has his missions for his disciples and he, they're probably wondering, where, how are we going to get to the whole world? And God says, uh-uh-uh, you wait for me and when I say go, I'm going to bring the world to you. Isn't that amazing? God has a plan. Don't get overwhelmed with, with what the, the gravity that God has for you. He, he provides the power of the Holy Spirit within you so that anything he puts in front of you that he's calling you to do, you'll be empowered to do. The disciples patiently waited. Now, uh, it talks about these tongues of fire that came on them. That sounds pretty dramatic, pretty crazy. Just want to be clear here. In, in some passages in the Bible, there's these things called the gifts of the tongues which is a spiritual kind of prayer language. That's not what they're talking about here. Here, what they're talking about is the physical nature of being able to talk in a different language, known language. Because all these people have come from all over the world, and there's different languages there. It would be like if I just started fluently speaking Spanish to you. I can't do that. That's what would have happened. Well, let's go a stage further. If I spoke Romanian to you, we had a, if we had a Romanian person, apparently... Um, I, I had some friends who are from Romania and they speak actually Hungarian and they say that that will be the language in heaven because it takes an eternity to learn and an eternity to speak. And so apparently there's some languages in the world that are tough. These disciples were speaking languages that everyone knew. Now a lot of them were like, this is crazy. And anytime you think something's crazy and you can't explain it, you say things like, they must be drunk. There must be some reasonable example. Something is going on. There's a trick happening. And, and Peter's like, no. That's not what's going on. One of the things that we, we like to do is, is kind of contrast um, things that God does throughout history. And here, what I see is a clear contrast between the Tower of Babel, Babel, depending on what country you're from, and, and what's happening here at Pentecost. God's people and, and the, the people on earth were, were in the time of the Tower of Babel. They were building this tower to try and get up to heaven. And God's like, no, that's, that's not what I'm about. So he brought all these different languages upon these people to bring confusion so that they couldn't continue with what they were doing. God confused them so they couldn't communicate with one another, different languages, and they separated, and the tower wasn't built the way it was meant to. And then here we see that at Pentecost, God didn't bring confusion. When the Spirit came and filled them, God brought clarity. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, when it comes inside of you, it empowers you to bring the good news of who Jesus is, clarity. You can't explain Christianity and force someone to believe it. You can bring them to church. You can be a witness. You can share the good news of who Jesus is. But at that moment they hear it, they have to make a decision. And the Holy Spirit is the one that calls them. And so in this, we see the power and the work being emphasized of what the Holy Spirit does. Now, for anybody who's not a Christian and, and hasn't experienced the Holy Spirit, this sounds weird. Maybe if you sit here, you're like, this is weird. This whole Holy Spirit, kind of supernatural, kind of weird stuff. It, it is, and, and that's what makes it so amazing. By definition, it is supernatural. If you could explain it in a way that was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Just a normal day in the life. It wouldn't have the power that it has, the gravity that it so when we're, we're thinking about what God's calling us to do, when we're living by the Spirit, following His guidance, we know that He will lead us in opportunities to be used in amazing ways. But it starts with, with being faithful, waiting, praying every day, God, please fill me with Your Spirit and lead and guide me to do Your work today. Is that what you pray each day? Oh man, I know, I get busy too. I get distracted. Got to get... Well, maybe you got to get your kids to school. Maybe you got to get up early, go to the gym. Maybe you got to stay up late because you got to work and you get busy and, and it gets tough. But I know that no matter what we do, the Spirit wants to work in the everyday of your life. The Spirit came at Pentecost. And what a spectacle. The disciples filled with the Holy Spirit in worship, being witnessed by so many. And this is what drew them in. You ever walk past like a live music and just been kind of sucked in to hear it? You're like, oh, this sounds pretty cool. I'm going to go and uh, listen to this for a bit. And then if you don't like it, you just leave. And here we see that the disciples worship. 
their worship sucked people in. Because people saw it and they said, I don't know what this is. This is crazy. These people are on fire. I don't, probably not literally, but the tongues of fire. And, and this is crazy. And we get to see the, that these people are worshiping in such a God-given way. And they were, they were sucked in. Now, uh, an aside here, a side note is, I, I just want to be clear that we believe worship is for an audience of one. As a, at our church, we believe that our, our singing, that our worship is just worship towards glorifying God. Because no cool song, no big lights and flashy stuff is ever going to win someone to Jesus if it's not spirit-filled. Now, those cool songs and flashy lights can be spirit-filled. But first and foremost, as worship, we want people to see the witness of us worshiping in the Spirit, glorifying God. Now, some people were skeptical, though. Um, Verse 14, so Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, And all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. He's going on to give the first message of the gospel preached by the official church. And he stands up and he explains this uh, multi-language miracle as the fulfillment of God's promise of the Holy Spirit coming to go out to the ends of the world. So that everybody could understand it. What's going on right there was all these Jewish people who believed in the Old Testament had come to this festival and and they believed that they were the chosen nation, that God was their God. And then this crazy Jesus guy changed it all. And I sympathize with them, but Jesus came and fulfilled the Old Testament so that everybody now has a way to be accepted. We're, We're not really a fire and brimstone kind of kind of church, it's not my style, but it doesn't mean that it's not true. We believe that, that if, unless you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, unless you have repented and have faith and follow after him, that that, that, that is the truth. However, we believe that Jesus is a loving, that God is loving and Jesus died for us and, and God doesn't want us to go to hell. That's why he invites us to heaven, but he's not going to force anybody to go somewhere they don't want to go. This is his desire. And so that Peter's sharing this message, and, and we can see that the Spirit worked through the 120 or so followers by bringing all these people to Jerusalem, these Jewish people, and all the people that were already living there. And the truth is, God meets us where we are. God met them where they were. He had a plan. He, he orchestrated it in a way where his people were ready. He provided the power, and they lived out and shared the good news both physically and spiritually, I I just want us to know that God can meet you wherever you are. Do you remember the first time you met God? Do you remember where you were physically? Do you remember spiritually and emotionally what you were feeling in that moment? I, I just want us to know, don't believe the lie that you're too far gone for God to meet you. Many people think that. They, they think things like, you don't know what I've done in my life. You don't know what's been done to me. You don't know what I did last night or, or what I'm thinking right now even. And, and, and I don't, but God does. And this is the good news. Um, I, I wore nice clothes today and everybody's been commenting on it. Apparently I don't wear nice clothes very often is, is the story behind that one. Uh, I'll blame that on living in New Hampshire. But um, I just offended, offended everybody. But sometimes people think that I need to dress myself up that I need to clean my life up. And once I get good enough, then God will welcome me in. That's often the case that people believe. And, and even if they don't say it that way, they, they think about it that way. And they think that, that if I do enough good things, then, then I can come to God, God will be happy with me, I'll make the grade, and we'll be good. But the problem is, nobody can be that good. And Jesus knows this, and, and so he doesn't condemn us to hell, he invites us a different way, that, a better way that leads to life. He said, I came to heal the sick. And all of us at some point have been spiritually sick in our lives. And, and he says, I'm here for you and I want to heal you. And the people witness this worship, the outpouring of the Spirit. And we see that Peter then gives them the good news in verse 22. He goes like this, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. 
This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. What a great start to a message. You killed Jesus. That's what he's saying, right? Well, what's really happening here is God meets us where we are, but God then opens our eyes to the truth, the hard truth. Tim Keller, famous uh, pastor who recently died, said this, they realized that they had been wrong about Christ at that moment. The Spirit opened their eyes and gave some clarity when confusion had led, and they started to realize that they'd been wrong about Jesus. Many people have opinions about who Jesus is, right? It, many people think, well, may, if he was real, then he must have just been a good man. Could have been a prophet. Some people say, oh, well, there's no proof. Prove to me that Jesus was alive, and, and we can go there and talk about that another time. But many people, they, they don't want to believe. And in this, we can see that God opens our eyes to the truth, and, and he opens our eyes to the truth of who Jesus really is. They've been wrong about it. And, and one of the things in our day and age today is we live by relative truths quite often. And I just want to clarify right now that just because you don't believe something to be true doesn't mean it's not true. Many people say, all right, it's okay for you to believe in your Jesus, but, but I believe in something different, so that's all right. I, I don't have to agree with you. Well, you don't have to agree with me, but doesn't mean you're right. Truth can be still be truth, even if you don't think it is. There is absolute truth, and Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And Peter lays out this simple but profound truth that, that starts to open their eyes to who Jesus is. The man that they crucified. He's the Messiah who was sent and raised from the dead. And they couldn't really refute it because this happened seven or eight weeks after the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And so some of the people who were there would have seen it. Not all of them. And some of the people there would have, uh, it said there was 500 witnesses that saw Jesus alive. And so they could ask him, I'm sure there's some of them then. Peter's probably like, yeah, turn to John right over there and go ask John. He saw him. He, he touched his, his hands. It wasn't just some weird hallucination that the, all these people, no, it's true, it happened. And so God opens their eyes, the Spirit opens their eyes to who Jesus really is. And then, next, He opens our eyes to the truth of who we really are. Because you can know who Jesus is, but, but until you know who you are in relation to Jesus, until you see what you've done and who you are, the, the Spirit hasn't opened your eyes. Because in this, we, we see in Verse 36, he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He's saying you're responsible for the death of Jesus. Now, Peter wasn't specifically saying they were the ones that, like, said, Bra free Barabbas, or they were in the crowd, or they were the ones, that, like, there's only a couple of soldiers that actually nailed him up on the cross. But what he's talking about is this global and personal responsibility that we have. And this is where a lot of people say, well, I'm out at this point because I'm a good guy and I don't deserve this. I haven't done anything wrong. I wasn't with Adam and Eve when they sinned. I wasn't in front of Jesus when he was crucified. In fact, I would have said, don't crucify Jesus. Let Barabbas and Jesus go free. And everybody would have been happy. No, we, we think that way. But there's, there's a global and a personal sense of responsibility. Romans 3.23 is the verse that really hits on this. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this is the hard nature about who we are. My past sin, my present sin, and my future sin is what caused Jesus to be crucified. Because there was a separation between us and God. And, and yes, we weren't there when Adam and Eve were alive. But God is outside of time. And it means that no matter who you are, what you've done, or what's been done to you, that, that all of us are sinners. And this would have been a terrible place if Peter stopped on the message. Because the law condemns us. But the fruition of where G of Peter's going next is all about Jesus. And the real talk is this. God loves you enough to tell you the truth about yourself. And that is one of the best things you could ever hear. The reason for that is this. You know what's inside your own heart. 
the things you've done, the things you've thought. Imagine this. Imagine giving your life to a God who lies to you. You wouldn't want to do that. If God looks at you and says, well, yeah, I, you haven't done anything wrong, you're like, well, you're lying. Or imagine giving yourself fully surrender to a God who isn't smart enough to know everything about you. I'm out on both of those occasions. God loves you enough to tell you the truth about who you are. Would you give your life to and surrender to someone who lied to you or couldn't actually see who you really were? I don't think so. This is what God's inviting us to do. God will meet us where you are, and when you see yourself in, in the mess of life and, and you know that there's a better way and you can be refreshed because he knows who you really are. You, can't, you don't need to hide it anymore. You don't need to, to worry about that baggage that you, you've been through. You can release it, surrender it to the cross, and ask for forgiveness. It's freeing. And God invites you into heaven. If you confess your sin, repent of what you've done, and ask for him to forgive you, the Spirit will come upon you. You'll be filled, forgiven. He knows who you really are. So you don't need to try and hide it anymore. And I mean, that didn't work for Adam and Eve, and it's not going to work for us today. God sees it, right? He's like, why are you hiding in the bushes again? I know, you did it again. I'll forgive you if you come. Just ask. So we see how the story continues in, in verse 37. It says, they were cut to the heart. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They were starting to see who Jesus really was. Oh man, can you imagine that revelation? We just killed the Messiah of the world. But he rose from the dead. And then they started to see who they were in reflection to Jesus. And, and they were cut to the heart. In John, 8, in John 16, 8, it talks about the coming of the Spirit, and it says this, When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And the words here that, that it's talking about, it, it's talking about like a conviction, a cross-examination, where when we say, oh, we're good, I'm a good person, the Spirit comes in and convicts. He brings clarity, and he, and he says, no, you're not. This is who you are, sinful. He doesn't just lead us there, but, but he exposes our lies, what's really going on in our hearts. Like at a courtroom where, where, so, where a witness is being put in front and, and he's being cross-examined and, and the, the lawyer comes up and, and says, you're lying. This isn't what happened. You're witnessing about something that, that isn't real or true in your life. And, and you know what, what the famous movie goes? You can't handle the truth. <laughs> But Jesus can. When you understand this, you move into a sense of, of personal sin and responsibility. You're no longer just breaking God's law, but you start to see how you're breaking God's heart. I remember when I was a kid, the first time uh, that, uh, not the first time that I broke my mom's rules, but the first time I broke my mom's rules and, and felt really bad about it. And, and it was something silly. I think it, we just took too many candy bars and she was all mad. And, and, and then I, we we were sitting there, and I said, why? I, I just want more. Can I just want another candy bar. And, and, and my mom, this is a silly story, but my mom literally goes, do what you want. Oh, I didn't just break a rule. At that moment, I, bro I broke her heart. She was like, I, I give up. You, you want your own way? Go ahead. Man, I think that had a deeper impact on any punishment, more than any punishment I ever got. And this is what happens. It says they were cut to the heart. They started to see what they'd really done with Jesus and who they really were. And the analogy is, it was like a, a knife to the heart, a cut in their heart. Anytime that you're cut to the heart, it demands a response. The spirit demands a response. And nobody should be like, all right, I'm cut to a heart. I got a dagger in my heart. Oh, all right, I'll just pull it out and go on with life. No. They were changed. It said 3,000 people were saved that day. How amazing is that? The simple truth, empowered by the Spirit, leads people to a point of choice, a conviction. This is what we want to be as a church, a beacon, sharing the truth, hope, and light of who Jesus is in our lives. And as we worship, as we come into our, our community, the, the ends of the world, people will see who Jesus is. This is the vision for our church. Now, many people think that, that faith starts with a feeling, and, and that's not 
kind of what I see happening in the Sermon of Peter's. He kind of sets across this framework where he provokes the mind to move the heart that leads to new spirit-filled lives. He starts with their minds. In verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. He says, you believe in the God of, of Isaac, Jacob? You believe he's your, your God? Well, this God is the one that points everything in Scripture to Jesus. He refers to the book of Joel. He refers to the book of Psalms. And, and he uses their understanding, their minds, to point towards the Messiah. This is the best message that he could have done. He said, this is what you believe. Let me help you see the fruition that Jesus has come to fulfill the law, everything you believe. This is what it was pointing to. This is what you've been waiting for. Should be good news, right? And then he goes into what, what leads to the notion of God's grace. Because if the Old Testament law points out all the things we do wrong, condemns us, Jesus brings the grace that forgives us. He's the way, the truth, and the life. It says, both Lord and Messiah in verse 36. He brings this, this new idea of grace that you don't have to be condemned. You can be set free. And then he goes into how that knowledge that led to heart change will now lead, I'm sorry, that knowledge that, that received grace will now lead to change in your heart. They were cut to the heart and answered, what shall we do? And out of this, we see a change in their thinking. We see how so many people made the decision, some didn't, but they made the decision to say yes. Just think, God brought the world to them to have an impact on them. He knew what he was doing. Instead of them trying to get ahead of God, the disciples followed his commands, patiently waited, and they let God impact their every day, and the Spirit showed up. Vance Havner says this, he says, we're not going to move this world by criticism, a lot of people, a lot of Christians try, of it, nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. When you combine wind with fire, you can get some terrible results as we're seeing with forest fires all around the world, but when you combine wind with spiritual fire, you quickly get a blaze and a church of people set on fire for the kingdom, empowered by the Spirit, will fan those flames, that small spark, into a mighty fire, a movement. Are you ready to be a part of the movement? This is what we call when we say to follow Jesus, one of our, our values as, as, as a church. We say, we want to follow Jesus. We want to be filled with the Spirit. He's not here physically, but His Spirit is within us. Now we need to know what that, that means, what that looks like. I recently went to a conference and heard a guy named Jay Pathak. He shared his story and he, he was sitting in his bedroom as, as a kid one day, and, and the Spirit convicted him as he was reading the Bible. He didn't really know anything about Jesus. All he knew was he went to a funeral at one point and saw a naked guy on a cross and thought that this is a weird Jesus. And then he started reading the Bible and got convicted, and, and it, he got saved. His mind was changed and his heart was changed. And out of that, he, he started working at a church, and he would throw big parties and big events, and, and what he... One day, he, he threw a party, a big event for 3,000 people, and he said 108 people showed up. <laughs> that would be a, a big failure, really, in our world, right? A lot of money, a lot of time, and 100 people show up to a party for 3,000. And he called his wife, and they were supposed to have home group that night, and he goes, cancel home group. Not having a good day. We'd done a funeral that day, too. And his wife was like, no, 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 you don't understand. We've, we've got people coming, and, and we'll have people bring food. It'll be okay. And, and he begrudgingly came home, and, and he, he said, okay, we'll do it then. And he walked into his house, and as he was walking in into this big apartment complex, there was a guy sitting in his living room playing guitar that he'd never met. And all these other people that he didn't know who they were. And, and he's talking to his wife, and his wife said to him, um, yeah, the, we, these people were just asking me, like, what's going on? Like, why do all these people come to your house every Wednesday night? And she said, well, you want to come? And she just said, she thought I invited people. And people said, okay, and they showed up. In the, in the every day, he'd done this huge event, and gone terribly, and he came home to all these people ready, eager, and willing to find community and a place to belong. He said he changed his life. He started to see that Jesus wants to work in the everyday of our lives. We're not going to experience something like Pentecost. That's a one-off. There's not going to be big winds and fiery tongues and all that kind of stuff, but when we are cut to the heart, we can experience new life. We can experience joy, fellowship, freedom. 
What if we slow down to see the Holy Spirit at work in the everyday of our life? What if, this quote from Jerry Pappett says, can you imagine how your city would be changed if every believer knew and retained the names of their neighbors and prayed for them, connected to them, served them, and cared for them? We got two cards that I want to send you guys home with today. One of them is a, an invite to our birthday party, and we'd love for you guys to invite them. We want to fill this, this place Invite people to just experience the, the worship and love we have for Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit. But we know in order to do that, you can hand it to people <laughs> and maybe someone will show up. But we know if we're truly going to be empowered by the Spirit, we need, we need to pray. So we have these, these sent cards. And on these sent cards, it just says, living out a courageous faith, a better way that leads to life. And what we want you to do is write down three names of people. And if it's a couple, you can write them down in one. If you have more than three names, that's whatever. Take a couple of cards. Do whatever. It, it's, don't get caught up in the details. But we want you to commit to praying for these people. Asking God to give you opportunities to invite them into a better way that leads to life. And as the Spirit moves, He's got something for us. He's going to do some great stuff. We're also going to have a day of prayer on September 6th. We're going to open our office in Londonderry from 8 to 4. But at noon, both online and in person, we're going to have a short time of prayer where we're going to pray that God would use us and fill us with His Spirit so that more people would see the good news of who Jesus is. When the Holy Spirit calls, we're cut to the heart. A part of a movement. People that move as a beacon of truth, hope, and light. And the invitation is to live a life marked by Jesus as you follow the Holy Spirit and guide us. I hope you're ready for that because we're praying and we want to see what God's going to do through our church. But we know you can do some big events, but really what matters is following the Holy Spirit in the everyday of our life, being obedient and sharing the good news of Jesus. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for you. We are so thankful that you are the God who knows us and will tell us the truth and that you love us. We just ask today that you would give us people to share your love with, that we would follow you, live in community, and love generously. Thank you, Jesus. Pray us in your name.